Hello, everyone. This is Manolo Concepcion. I am the new associate head coach at Eastern Illinois University. I have been here for maybe about four months, um, and two of those months have been spent on this pandemic. Um, when I started and uh, created this program called Volley Junkies, uh, with the intent of trying to unify uh, the volleyball community around the world by learning from different backgrounds and experiences of our guests. Um, so basically that's the concept of the program that we're trying to establish here. Um, we're actually using a new platform today, so I'm really excited about it, but I'm also excited about the guests that we have because he's someone that has so much promise and he has already achieved so much. Um, but it's probably, if, you're, if you live outside of, outside of the US, it's probably one of the best coaches that you do not know about yet. Okay, and I want to introduce it to you today. His name is John Newman Gonchoy. Oh, John, how are you? Hey, Manolo, good to see you. Thank you for having me on. John uh, is the head coach for the University of New Mexico. Um, John has been involved with that program now for a couple of years. Um, he's uh, working on rebuilding the program, but he has also been involved in very important programs on, around the nation and then including USA Volleyball. Those are a couple of the subjects that we're gonna touch base today, along with talking a little bit about techniques, tactics, and maybe we're gonna dig into motor learning, of course. So, um, but first of all, John, tell me how you, your family, and your players are dealing with this current situation. Yeah, well, th thank you again. I, I uh, just just looking, you know, at, at the, the body of work you put into this this project that you're putting together. It's it's such an honor to be able just to spend a little time with you today. So, uh, so before we get going, I just want to say thank you again for what you're doing for all of the volleyball community across the world. Because uh, I have friends all over the place that that are saying, man, that he's putting together such awesome guests. And I said, I know he's taking a shot at having me on. So, <laughs> so <I appreciate laughs> having me on. But um, we're doing well. We're doing well. We. Um, you know, I think a little over two, you know, uh, we're almost heading into month three of this. And uh, it's been it's been just, hey, what can we can control? What what can we control? And, and, and the things that we can't control, the things that we don't know, we've really got to get good at letting it go. Because, uh, you know, for me personally, as our family, you know, we're we're doing the best we can just to stay safe. And, and my team is all over the world. We've got four different countries and 12 states uh, of where athletes are. And, and it's what can you control? What can, what can you do every day to get yourself ready? For when the day comes that we all get back together and so uh so we're doing well we're we're, we're hanging in there and, and, and just kind of adapting and adjusting in real time and every day there's some new information or there's a new decision being made and uh so we're right there with you john before we dig into the past um can you tell me a little bit about what is your conference saying about the chances of playing the ncaa division one season now uh this fall yeah, so we're having we've had we've had probably five um, at conference calls between our coaches, the, the coaches from the Mountain West Conference Volleyball um, kind of group, and um, you know the plan started out as okay, what is the season going to look like, and, and are we going to have to make some changes to uh, the regular season? And uh, I think what we're what we're finding is that, that we're going to get a little bit more condensed, that that the season might be a little shorter. Uh, for our conference. And that's just speaking about the Mountain West. I know other conferences are still working on their uh, their structure of what that season's going to look like. But for us, they, they, they've removed the conference tournament this year. So at the end, the, the season is going to end, um, looks like before Thanksgiving for us specifically. Um, and they're looking like there's a possibility that we were going to cut at least one full week of competition. Mm -hmm. So um, so it, it went from an 18 match regular season for, for Mountain West Conference. And then, then the last week is the conference tournament to um, at least it's right now at least a 16 match cut. And then it possibly could go down to 14. Um, but uh, we're, we're they say, John, that, hey, we're going to play almost 100 percent. We're just finding a way to do it. What do you feel about it? Like, is this going to happen, you think? 
I do. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. I've got to be. I mean, that's that's the role that I'm in. Is I got, I got to pump people full of hope. You know, hey, we're we're gonna get there, and, and it's gonna happen. And, and there's a, there's there's a there's this new normal of that we're all getting used to. And, and I think that new normal, the season's gonna look different. You know, how we travel, uh, how we, you know, do we give high fives before the match? Do we not? Do we <laughs> just wait? You know, I don't know. And and I think that as we get going in this and, and we learn more and more about, okay, how can we stay safe? How can we keep our athletes protected? Um, and how do we make sure our communities then don't get impacted? I think we're going to see it change. Um, but, but I've got to believe that it's coming. You know, I've got to believe that there's a season around the corner. We are talking again with John Newman, um, who is the head coach of the University of New Mexico in the NCAA Division I here in the United States of America. Um, just want to mention uh, really quickly for the people who are watching uh, from all around the world right now. Um, just want to let you know that by NCAA rules, when I'm talking to an or NCAA coach, I cannot bring any comments from the comments area of this feed. Um, we might ask the same questions that you present, um, but we cannot present you as part of the conversation because of the NCAA, uh, NCAA rules. So, but please feel free to come, continue to comment about it. Let us know where you're actually watching from. Uh, I would love to know how many countries we have involved in this conversation. And anything that we mention here, if you have any feedback about it, please continue to provide those feedbacks uh, through the comment section. So, um, John, let's dig into your past a little bit and tell me, uh, tell me about your coaching. Tell me, tell me the moment in your coaching career that you felt like that you were starting to learn how to learn. <laughs> Yeah, it might have been before coaching, you know, it, it, because I wasn't a very good volleyball player, you know, and you've had a lot of really good players come on, you know, that have amazing backgrounds. And that, that's not me. I, I, I played club volleyball and high school volleyball, but I, I wasn't a player. I was a listener. I, I was listening. I was watching. I was observing. And I wasn't I wasn't playing a whole lot, you know, but I just loved the sport. And my my parents, Manolo, are, are, are both professors. So wow. mom and dad. 35 years of professor of, of professorship. Where at, John? Where at? Yeah, my father's at, at a small liberal arts university in Southern California called the University of Laverne. And I've been there. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people will know them because at, at one time they had an amazing, amazing volleyball program. They, they were, they were, you know, they did. Uh, Division three national championships at the time. Yeah. And yes. my mom uh, is at is at the is at Cal State University Los Angeles. So uh, oh. C. ULA, uh, not UCLA, but CSULA. And so she's been there for 35 years and both are professors of psychology. So I'm oh, a product boy. of psychologist. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So um, any any kind of neuroses or, or things that go on in my mind, uh, I, I just thank my parents, you know, for all that good stuff. How were yeah. those conversations at dinner? Do you always feel like you were getting investigated and analyzed? Yes. Uh, were you ever had, you ever had like relaxed conversations? Uh, well, with I'll tell you, I, I'm the youngest, right? So I have an older brother and older sister. And, and, and whenever there was a disagreement or a physical altercation, we weren't sent to our rooms. We were sent to the couch to talk. And, oh, and, and boy. <laughs> what, what kind of led to that? So very much, um, very much that was the case. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so then, you know, you, of course, you had a great background then at home um, where the emphasis about and the importance about learning was something that was probably, you know, inculcated from your own house. So tell me, you know, you get into coaching and then you felt that you were really good at what? I think I was, I think, I think I had to say with the relationship side, Manolo, I, it had to be, it had for me much more to do about this, you know, communication and building, building trust and, and creating psychological safety. Um, much more than X's and O's because when you're not a, a super high end player, right? I, I don't have the experience of a national championship or, Hey, I played for the national. I don't have that. I, what I have is, is you and, and getting to know you and how can I help you and how can I serve you and, and making it so much less about me as it was about you. And, and I think that's maybe the skill that I had. I, it wasn't, you know, everything that I, that I learned was self-taught, right? I mean, I had to go and, and ask questions and I had to go and sit in other coaches practices when I was still in college, I would go and do this and, and just watch and take notes. And, and, and I had no idea what I didn't know, you know, that the, the, the old adage, you don't know what you don't know. You know? And so, yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I think I, Who were the, those coaches that you're talking about? Like you were sitting in, mm. in what coaches gym, mm. like what, 
Who are your biggest influencers at that point? Okay, a, a great question because it, it evolved. But at that point, um, I, I I would go. Al Skates is at UCLA at the time, and I would go and I would sit, and he wouldn't even he would walk right by. You know, he doesn't even pay attention to, doesn't say a word. I felt like a fish out of water. But I'm sitting there with my little notebook, you know, scribbling down drills or just observing things and. I went from his practice to John Sparrow's practice. He was at University of California, Irvine at the time. Um, so I went from here to there. Uh, and then I went uh, to UC Santa Barbara uh, a few years earlier. I'm kind of thinking back now to Ken Preston, yes. um, Kathy Gregory, uh, and just watching and just seeing what are they doing. And and I didn't know anything. I, I just would go and, and ask. And, and and there was email was still a pretty, you know, it, it would happen. But, you know, you wouldn't hear back from people. But so you just showed up and, and you know, and, and you found out that, that observational learning was was just my skill, and and I had to I had to use it because I didn't have the experiential learning. I wasn't I wasn't an experienced player, so that's how I had to go and do it. Very different coaches, very different backgrounds. What did they all have in common? You think? Mm. <sighs> Great question. I the, the 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 piece that sticks out to me right away is just how hard their teams played. <laughs> like that, okay. you just just saw how hard they got after it. And, and again, I, to look back and to think about feedback or to think about, okay, what was the learning environment like? I, that, that's, I'm, I'm, you know, it, I, I was there when Al Skates had the curtain, you know, and here's this group and, and here's another group oh, over here. And yeah, I was, I mean, I went and watched and, and you know, at, at, at John Sparrow's practice, I, I can recall just being so amazed at how he communicated with these guys. And, and, and to me, they're just behemoth men that are just so physical and, and, but boy, he he really had a handle on his group, and then Kathy Gregory's team, how 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 hard they worked, and just how much they grinded, and and Ken Preston's teams, same thing. They just loved their coach. They they you could tell, you know, and 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 I, I could tell that from just walking through the door, how they communicated with them and how they listened to him. That 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 there was just some, there was a lot of passion for him as a guy, as a coach, as a man. So we're gonna go back and forth, um, John. You know, and it's not gonna be chron chronologically, but I. Sure. I want ask you this like you know in in that process um do you think that there was a a key element that they provided you with um that showed you that relationships is the number one thing in your process mm. you know I, i i think i think watching watching them interact with their teams i think i think maybe just the interaction that i was watching and observing and i, and I wasn't there for an extended period of time Um, I would I, I, I can recall two or three practices at each one of those gyms, you know, throughout the different times when I was in, at home in Southern California while I was in college doing this. And and I think just watching the interactions, Manolo, you know, I, I think just watching how they how they communicated. And it wasn't, uh, you know, of course, they got on them when they needed to. You know, I think there's there's hey, I got to kind of nudge you. And then, hey, maybe it's now I'm going to shove you. Hey, you got to get better. Let's go. You know, and um, and and so I think not not that I ever saw them actually do that physically. I think you understand the, the kind of yeah. where I'm going with yep. this, is yep. how, how they communicated to them and how they relayed that message. You could tell that there was, yeah, there was incredible trust and there was incre incredible safety and, and this idea, hey, you belong here and, and I'm going to coach the heck out of you because you belong here and you're going to be great. And and just watching that, I think, is, is maybe what what triggered something back here to say, wow, that's pretty that's pretty important skill. So I mean, you might not have played in the national championship finals or you may not have been at the Olympics, But hey, you, you can do this, John. You know that's kind of maybe what what triggered for me, John. As a player, my first question to myself when I got into a gym with a new coach was, "Can I trust you?" Um, mm -hmm. You know, and what do you think that makes coaches um, able to be trusted by players, even with different personalities? Um, what do you think is something that we must have for that to happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating that you say that because I, I wonder if you, you know, I, I just now that I look back at that, you know, that's so true. That's that's maybe the first thing we think about is, hey, does this person have my best interest at heart? Yeah. You know, we say core values, you know, and this idea that core values comes from the word core, which is Latin for heart or, or from you know here. And do, at, at your spirit, at your core, do you, do you really have my best interest or, or is there something behind the scenes? And, and I think What, what, what resonates for me, coach, is this idea that, that, that I, can, I want to create this environment where people feel safe. I want them to feel I can go take really big risks and I can look like an absolute bonehead, but I'm trying what my coach just told me and it's really hard and I don't know if the outcomes are going to lead to success or failure or winning and losing, but I can go and do this stuff. And if I can go and do it and I can feel like, hey, my coach has my back, 
my team has my back, then, hey, I'm going to take that risk every single day. And when we're risking like that all the time, we're putting it all on the line all the time. Like there's no other way for us to go than to get better, you know? And so um, I think that's got to be it for me is this, is this idea of psychological safety. And I got I to feel safe. I got to feel like I belong. John, as a coach in the beginning of my career, I, I felt like I was doing like everything so great. But then I look back <laughs> and I'm like, I did some dumb things uh, along the way that actually keep me awake at times thinking about it. It's like, did I really try that? Did I really do that? Um, is there anything that, you know, that, that haunts you uh, from those first years uh, as a coach that you, you thought that you were the bomb because of it? And oh. then you feel like, no, that was oh. not good. This this profession will humble you really quickly, won't it? It, it? it will absolutely, it'll push you back in your chair and go, hold on a second, I got to slow down. I, I really have no idea what the heck I'm doing. And yeah, those moments still happen, coach. They're still happening all the time. And, you know, I think they're just changing. You know, they're changing form. You know, it's not the same. The quality of the mistakes are changing. Yes, yes, yes. But, you know, I, I, I look back and I'm thinking back to a practice that I ran when I was the student assistant at Northern Arizona University. So, uh, as a student assistant, I could run practices when the team left to go out of town. Oh, wow. I okay. practices. <laughs> and I was 20, 20 years old, maybe not even 21. And I had them transitioning around a chair and then they had to touch something and then they had to go and spike it. You know? <laughs> and then they had to come back to the chair and I would toss a ball. I think, what am I doing? What, what is this? this isn't volleyball so yeah yeah a lot of those moments yeah but i i bet that in that practice you were like why they cannot do it like this is yes. so easy this is so relatable this is yeah. so transferable to reality <laughs> yeah absolutely i, I why yeah why wasn't this going to make you better at playing actual volleyball when there's not chairs and, and pads and stupid <laughs> things out there that i was doing I, yeah i had no idea what i was doing yeah. coach um name me some of the best coaches that you have worked for and with <sighs> Without hurting anyone's feelings that you're yeah, of mentioned, we just, you know what? I'm just naming yeah. three, three of them. Yeah, um, I would, I would, I would and, and again, I, I think I just go back in my career and I think of the most influential people that, that have had, uh, that have had some impact on me. You know, if I, I don't know how else to describe it other than a block of clay, right? That's me, a big dense block of clay. I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, and people molded and shaped and, and, they, and they, 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 they contoured it and, and they, they had an impact in it. And, 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 and here I am now, and I'm nowhere near where I want to be because I still want to get better. I still want to be challenged. And I, I look back at, at Kathy Gregory taking a risk on me to, to come and, and work at her camps and, and taking me under her wing. I, I, I look back at my time with Tom Black, six years. Um, and he's still, I mean, he's still, we were on a, a Zoom just a couple, I don't know, uh, a couple weeks ago, and he was, he was still teaching me. We were watching film together, and he's still teaching me to this day. And um, I, I think from there, to Christy Johnson Lynch um, at Iowa State, um, just mm -hmm. incredible mentor. We did a Zoom call where I introduced her to my son. She's never met my, my 10 month, oh. 11, 12 month old son. Sorry, I keep, yeah, threw that off. Um, he's just about a year now. And, and, and then to Jason Watson at the University of Arkansas. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously, you know, I think, I think spending time with our national team program, whoever the head coach had been or whoever the coach is, is, is always pretty important. But this, the last eight years, we've been lucky enough to have Karch Karai as our head coach. And, and I, <laughs> I, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. You know, I, just the impact that he's had on me as a learner, as someone that, that I that I just look up to as a man, as a father, as a husband, and and he's just um, yeah. So I, those those four for sure stick out. Well, I, um, let's let's start from from the from the back. Um, and you mentioned Karch Kirao, and this is what he has to say about you. His dedication to servant leadership, to teaching, and to learning has certainly had a special impact on our USA women. And I expect he will have the same impact to, on everyone in the UNM program for both the short term and long term. Um, so he has big words to mention and say about, you know, what what you offer to the USA volleyball program. Um, mm. You know, and, and when you have people like that mention you, you know, he says a lot about you. Let's, you know, and, and again, let's see Jason Watson. He says he brings to UNM a passion and professionalism for a sport that he loves, the student athletes he will coach now and in the future will graduate better volleyball players, better students, and equally important, better people. And then Christy says, it is, a, you know, it's a great fit and he, he will give it everything he's got. Johnny's ready for this opportunity and I have no doubt he will achieve great things for the Lobos. Um, mm. So, but they're very, you know, three very different coaches. Um, tell me a little bit about working for Christy. Um, how did it go, you know, and, and, and then in accordance to your own principles, 
How was that matchup? Yeah, that, great question. You know, I think um, you, you kind of have to go a little bit before Christie to kind of to, to kind of get, get gear you know, see where my 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 head was at or how I was geared, how I was wired. You know, and, and spending six years with Tom Black and Kevin Ring uh, at UC San Diego with the men and the women, and then to Loyola Marymount, where where I think there's there's a heavy emphasis on, on certain aspects of that program and, 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 and what made those programs tick and what made those programs work and flow. And, uh, and, and those were completely different things that made Christie's program so successful uh, that it wasn't that, that, that it was, that it was, that they were different types of people. I think it was the way they wanted their programs to be run and mm -hmm. uh, Christie's emphasis on, on on defense and you know just just looking at some specific things christy's emphasis on defense and defensive urgency and intensity was something i'd never been a part of i'd never seen players flying around the court i mean i think at one point manolo and, and you know you, you can relate to this i think her teams at one point were averaging 16 or 16 and a half digs per set which is a lot of digs. <laughs> wow. it, it means it's really hard to score uh, you know the ball is going to come back at you right. if you you hit it us right and, and you don't kill it we're, we're gonna send it back your way and uh and she was just it was fascinating to me i hadn't experienced that and i think her emphasis on blocking and her emphasis on defense were much different i think with with tom and, and kevin emphasis on serving emphasis on receiving um emphasis on the speed of the offense and i think christy what the, the amazing thing for me was working with christy was just how open she was um it was that, that she you bring her an idea and oh Yep, that's it. I'm doing that tomorrow. It was let's think about this. Let's how will this impact this player? How will this player fit with that system? And I think that that was really interesting for me because that was much different than time with Tom and Kevin, where here's the system and here's the players and how they, how they kind of fit into that. And Christie's was here's the players and let's build that system around those players. So do we need to set a higher, slower ball to the right side? Um, do our middles need to be really good only at going off one foot? And there's a lot of X patterns or a lot of crossing routes. You know, whatever it was for Christy, she was going to work the system around the players. And I think for Tom and Kevin, they were really stuck. Uh, stuck is not the right word. They were really strict on this is the system of play. Right. Does that make sense? Am I? No, absolutely. Absolutely. No. And the reason that I bring it up is because, you know, in, throughout this two months of conversations, there's one absolute truth that I have found and that there's none. Um, you know, people yeah. in, in different ways. We have great coaches that have come into the programs like Marcelo Mendez that has coached the Zara Crusader, which is probably the best professional team in the world uh, in men. So he talks about how much he likes block training, you know, yes. and then yeah. you have someone completely different like Anastasi or Guidetti or Daniel Castellani or Miguel saying, hey, no, we're all about more than anything randomness. So, yeah. so and I, you know, and I see Chris, you know, Chris Johnson from Iowa State, you know, loving more the block type of training, but being so successful at what she does and how she does it as well. Um, and I think that she has what you talk about in the beginning, the relationship skills that she has, people say are above and beyond. So those are two elements that for me, um, are very attracted to a program like she runs. But then at the same time, you have Tom Black, you know, having such a successful program, whatever he has been, now yeah. now building Canada um, with more than anything randomness. So where do you stand in this debate? Like where, yeah. where is John Newman on that yeah. block versus random uh, type of uh, <laughs> situation? Great, great question. I, uh, I, I... I've been asked that before because they, they, there are two different people, you know, there are two different coaches and they, and they tackle this, this, this task in such different ways. And, and I think one thing that comes to, to mind for me is, okay, what resonates for me most is, is this idea that, 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 we, that I, if it doesn't look like volleyball for me, it's hard for me to get excited about it. Right. It's hard for me to go, okay, yeah, we're going to stand in a line and I'm going to hit balls at you for, you know, for a long time and get you better. And I'm going to get on a bus that doesn't resonate for me. And so I've watched and then I observed, and then I kind of blended some of those things and said, okay, this is what resonates for me. This is what I can hold on to every single day that makes me who I am. And, and, and for me, it's, it's getting ugly with it. It's getting into the crunchy space of, of Hey, it's really chaotic. It, everyone does everything. And I think that's more of an international model of development um, mm -hmm. that everyone's going to do everything. And so our middles go to passing school uh, and people say, oh, why are you wasting your time? No, because they need to be able to perform the skills of the game. And the game is at some point going to demand that they use their platform to, 
to deflect the ball to a target. It's going to happen. And so I better have I better have prepared them or that's on me. If we lose that point, that's on me. And I don't like it when it's on me. I mean, I do. You know, I understand that, that, that it's on me all the time. But um, I, it's my job. Coach, we spent uh, and I think this is kind of a little out there, but we spent um, 15 minutes and less than that, probably closer to 10 minutes um, this spring in practice before uh, quarantine practicing jump top spin spike serves. Mm-hmm. Because if you leave my program, you have to be able to perform all the skills of the game. Otherwise, I'm negligent as a coach. I've got to teach you all the skills of the game. And will we ever jump top spin serve in a game? No, no, I, we're not going to. No, unless one of these, one of my athletes really develops something and they can, they can generate some power and, and, and create some opportunities for us. But the, the reality was I, I, I just thought about it. I said, man, I, my, my, my middles don't know how to set very well. And so I got to get them better at setting. I've got to get my setters better at attacking. And so we spend a little time every practice where everyone does every single single one of the skills in different formats, whether it's three on three, four on four, two on two, we even play some one on one. Um, but that's because I like it getting ugly. So if you ask me, where do I, where do I stand? I, I stand much more on the random side, but I, I'll take it even further. I like it crunchy. I like that, that where it's not so smooth. And, and I think that's where the good stuff happens. How do you deal with the screen, the skill acquisition process in your practice with your staff? Because maybe me as your player, I am in the cognitive stage in a simple thing like going on a four step approach and yeah. being in a second step tempo. But then, you know, I, I have, you have another player team that she's already autonomous in that area. Maybe she just needs yeah. to work on high hands at that point, not worry about footwork. So, and timing. So, How do you deal with that? Do you distribute those responsibilities along your staff? Do you talk about that? Like, do you actually verbalize, hey, let's treat this player as a cognitive right now. She's an associative. She's trying to understand mm-hmm. that motor program. Or, or like, how do you do it on your own training? Yeah, so I think it's, so I think when it comes to kind of the, the, the skill acquisition for some of the, for, for our six essential skills, you know, maybe there's seven if we include reading as a skill. Um, right. And, and, and I think we would, we would all say, hey, a really good reader is, is worth, you know, worth its way, you know, worth her weight yeah. in goal, you know, is, is I can read and respond to the game and, and to the demands of the game. So I, I think for us in Manola, it, it comes down to intra-task variation. So for some of them, you're absolutely right. Hey, we're working on having a really good slow to fast tempo or good rhythm to our approach. And maybe, maybe, like you said, that's a setter. Maybe that's one of our liberos who's going to get some, a libero in our gym gets reps at, at all of the skills. So she's going to attack. Um, and that's just because, the, again, I, that's how I feel about it. I, that's maybe not right or wrong. It's just what I feel. And so she's going to get some time and versus our outside hitter who has 10 years of, of being an outside hitter from U12 all the way now to a sophomore in college. Um, and, and so she's so she's yeah, we're working on some different range with her. And she and she's got that. We, 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 what we like to do is before on Mondays, we like to spend time building out a task list for them for the week. Mm-hmm. So cut into my practice time and, and right or wrong, you know, people can say what they want, but I said, I'm willing to lose practice time to have these conversations with my athletes in a one-on-one setting. What is it we want to get better at? Let's watch some film. Let me give you a visual demonstration. Let me show you the best in the world performing this skill. Maybe it's this cross body down the line shot. Maybe it's this hard wrist away shot to the corner, whatever it is. Let me show you what the best in the world are doing. Let's evaluate that based off where you're at and let's create a task list on Mondays. And so I'm willing to lose half hour, 45 minutes of practice time just because I have athletes coming in every 15 minutes to meet with myself and my two assistant coaches that are doing the exact same thing. So within that, I do think we give them the ability to have really intentional focuses for the week. And sometimes they stay the same. Hey, we're not quite getting where we want to go with that yet. Let's stay with this. Let's stay with this piece of the skill. For the people watching around the world, not John Newman, John Newman is the head coach, head coach for the University of New Mexico in the NCAA Division One. Um, John, let's talk a little bit about deliberate practice. Um, how does deliberate practice reflect on your own uh, day-to-day operations at University of New Mexico? Yeah, great question. I think I think we're 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 in the thick of it. We're We're every day looking at how can we gain the one percent advantage, and maybe some days it's almost like just the the point one percent. You know, we're just hey, we just got to get a little bit better here. We got a little bit. Can we can we just squeeze out a little more from you there? And and for us with this idea of deliberate practices, is can we put in place the structure to give you the opportunities to respond to the demands of the game? So can I write a practice that allows you to get better? One, can I demonstrate that? Two, can I make sure you have a really effective visual or Um, mental representation of what we're trying to get better at today. And that's, that's my job. I've got to prepare that for you. And I've got to make sure that you understand what it is we're trying to get better at. 
And then we've got to be really intentional with our feedback. So the deliberate practice side of that for me is let's identify where we want to go. Let's, let's, let's put a roadmap together and then let me give you some instruction. Let me give you some, some information about how we're going to get there and keep it as simple as possible. And then let me get the heck out of your way and you and go play. And then we'll evaluate it. You know, coach, every day after practice, we come to the whiteboard and we evaluate as a team, we evaluate how we did and individually players evaluate on their own, how they did today, staying focused on their anchor. You know, what, what am I anchored to today in practice? Some people call it a goal or a mini goal or a focal point. For me, it's an anchor. This is, this is where I'm anchored today. This is where I'm, where I'm trying to get better. And so an example of what they can see and evaluate as their goals in practice. Let's say that we are in your two a day, normal preseason situation. Yeah. Um, yeah. You are in week one, John. Um, how would your goals and expectations in the dry race board look like? Yeah, you know, I think I think for us, it, it, week one, we're, 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 we're kind of going back to volleyball camp. We're going back to volleyball school. And we're going to put together our skills because we know that, uh, and I've heard you say this and I've heard coaches say it, and, and I think we, we all believe it at our, at our core, where we're at, that, that we cannot perform tactically what we can't, we, we, we can't do technically, right? We, we can't execute. And, and our fundamental skills have to be in place and we've, and we've got to feel like, hey, we, we, we can draw on these and we can lean on these fundamental skills. So for us, it, it could be, hey, we're, we're trying to get our liberos really good angling high to their left shoulder. Can we get really good angling high to your left shoulder, facing the ball, angling the platform to your target uh, and holding it. And so maybe within that, maybe our libero is just focused on this idea of an early angle. Can I prepare that angle early and hold it for a long period of time? And so what she's going to do after practice is more than we, we kind of give them the space. I try not to micromanage this. I give I give my libero the space to go over to the whiteboard and put a plus sign. Hey, I got better at this today. I was really mindful. I was really intentional about it. It doesn't mean that it was a perfect outcome. What it means is that I was really intentional about perfect effort towards this. Perfect effort versus perfect outcome. And so she gives herself a plus mark. It doesn't matter if the ball was in system 20, 30% of the time. Uh, ideally, we'd like to be a little above 50 or you know low 60s. But if she's not there, she's not there. But she was perfect in her effort, in her intentionality to get better. And so that would be week one. And, and our attackers would have some really simple focal points, just like you just mentioned. Is it a four-step approach? Is it having a really good down, back, and up so we can generate a really good kind of bow and arrow or, or generate a really good rotation to load our arm to hit? Um, and so, so we would ask them to just break the skill down and we'll help them. Sometimes they get a little ahead of themselves. And we mm -hmm. hey, Back. Let's get really good at our feet first and then kind of work from the ground up, you know, uh, work from the ground, from our feet to our to our arms, to how do we load? How do we unload our arm um, and how do we attack with range and power? So we would give them a little a little piece and say, let's go get better at that little piece. So let's go back to learning to learn and, and ask you about then measuring progress, measuring process over outcome. Um, how do you make sure in the beginning of your you know, skill development that they're not too focused on, hey, I just want to win this drill yeah. no matter how, yeah. you know, yeah. you know I want to win yeah. a serving drill even if I'm serving backwards, uh, you know, yeah, right. like, that. like how do yeah. you avoid those situations and how do you keep that emphasis on the process and uh, learning rate? Yeah, I, th I, I think it starts with, with educating them. I think it starts with them understanding who I am and, and why it is I do what I do. And, and I think that helps them to know where I'm coming from. And, and it's not that every one of them has to think like me or be me. That's not it at all. It's here, here's, here's our, our, our big rocks, our volleyball priorities. And, and maybe big rocks is this term that I like. I think it's just a little different. It's unique. I know a lot of coaches use it. But maybe another way of saying that is here's our volleyball priorities. And so here's what we're going to be trying to get better at every single day. And I don't think it's going to be a light switch. I don't think it's going to be, okay, hey, all of a sudden we, we have defensive urgency or we have defensive discipline. That was a big deal to me when I first got here. We weren't. We weren't playing defense the way that I would like us to play with, with some discipline and with the ability to, to read and respond uh, from, from some really good spots on the court. So um, I, I think we, we talk daily about it, Coach. You know, I think we're putting it into place with a quote of the day, and, and usually the quote of the day is about failure. It's about, uh, it's about learning. It's about developing or growing. And, and I think that's, that frames the conversation. That frames it. And that way in practice, I go, hey, let's think about this. We, we, we had a quote over here, and I, and I can always have something that's not just me saying it. But it's always us bringing it back to this idea that the faster we fail, the faster we're going to learn. And, and this, 
this gym, my, my gym, it's not mine, it's the university's, but, but, but when I'm in there, it's mine. And uh, this is our laboratory. This is, we are scientists when we're in here. We're here to learn. We're here to fail. That's what scientists do all day until they figure out that one, that one experiment that went right. Awesome. But they spent all day doing it. And so we're going to do that every single day. Gosh, I don't know, for two hours a day, two hours and a half a day, we're going to fail a ton. And fail doesn't have to be a bad word. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to have a personal impact on you. Failing is like, heck yeah, I'm reaching beyond my potential and it didn't work out. Awesome. Let's get back to work. There's more to do. Um, and when we do, and when we do get there, coach, and when we do feel like, hey, they're, they're going in the right direction, we celebrate the heck out of it. And we, we jump up and down and I'm hooting and I'm hollering for them because, hey, taking big risks is what this thing is about for me. John, I'm, I'm getting into the gym, uh, your gym for the first time. I'm afraid of making mistakes because I'm a perfectionist. Mm. I come from a, maybe a family or a club or a high school that made me that way, that fit, that is like either, you know, first of la or last. Um, uh, one of the, my favorite movies, uh, quote. Um, yeah. tell, me, tell me a little bit about that mindset. How do you actually create a growth mindset out of that if I'm actually afraid of making mistakes? Yeah, I think it. Uh, I think it gets really crunchy. I think that's where it gets really crunchy in there. It gets kind of muddy, and and I think it gets really uncomfortable. And we talk about in our gym quite often that comfort is completely overrated. There's there's especially when we're trying to do what we're trying to do, which is go into really uncertain situations where we don't know the outcomes. I can win. I can lose. I can fail. I can succeed. These are all going to happen. And the reality is, is that we have to, as coaches, is my job, and I explain this to them very early on. My job is to be more stubborn than you. So you may not want to change. You may not want to try this new thing because you're so good at it, doing it this way. And I, I, I understand that. But it's my job to create an effective learning environment. It's my job to be an effective teacher. And, and in that, how can I, you know, it, it's, this daily, it's this daily kind of relight the candle, relight the flame that says, hey, we are going to come into practice. It's going to be hard. It is, I expect you to get frustrated. But how you handle that frustration is how I'm going to, is, is really my job to kind of help guide you back on course. I expect, I, I don't expect practice to be fairy tales and, and ponies and glitter and, you know, and, and donuts at the end of it, you know, falling from the sky. It's not going to be that way. It's really hard because we don't know the outcome. We're going into uncertain situations all the time. My team is going to go play another team and it's 50, 50, right? Win or lose. I, I flip a coin, win or lose two, two teams perfectly paired up. My job is to help you help us get the 50.1 advantage, mm -hmm. just that one advantage the, the the margins are so slim i looked back at our 2019 season that, that wasn't the outcome that i wanted of course not i, I you know I, yeah it wasn't right where i wanted to be but we had to go back and say okay two points separate us when we lost matches 1.7 points on the whole scheme of the match separated us from winning and losing that match Ooh, that hurts that hurts heartbreak heartbreak Yeah. And you've been there as a, you know, you've been there all the time. And so and we're all been there, but my job is to help learn from that and then get us back on course so that Monday morning we're as motivated and as excited to get back to work and to get back to failing um, as, as anything, you know, we're, I need to keep that enthusiasm there for, for that process because otherwise we start going off trail and I, I think it's hard to get them back. Are you deliberately working on developing that rope mindset since day one in your gym like what's what's the most important thing on your big rocks you know and beyond the vocal part you know we're not touching the technical tactical part yet yeah is yeah. that part of your big rocks it's it's our very first one it's it's uh it's this idea of learning and and i, I i'm kind of a like I, i need a catchy phrase like that's just how my my mind works like so i had learning like legends and so we i wanted to study who are the legends of not only you know, the world of volleyball, but who are the legends of just UNM volleyball in the past 10 years? Who are some of the legends? Who are some of the people that, that we're standing on the shoulders of? And, and, and I think when, when you look back at it, Hey, they learned like legends. They, they weren't perfect at this stuff. They, they grinded and they went through some really, really crunchy stuff to get to where it was smooth. And even then it's really not that smooth. It's never as smooth as it, as it looks, you know, it's somewhere in between, you know, those two areas, crunchy and smooth. It's somewhere right in the middle, but, um, I think for us, it's 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 the number one big rock, and and for and the way that I talk about it is 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 we learn like legends, which means we we fail fast, we fail often, and we fail forward. And if we're doing those things, there's going to be a lot of learning that takes place. And you might you might leave practice more mentally fatigued than physically fatigued. Like that might be part of the deal. 
Let's talk about Tom Black and the concept of feedback. Um, tell me, tell me a little bit. What did you learn about you know from him in in his gym about feedback and their interaction with players, and then the concept of guided discovery within that? Yeah, um, I, I I think for Tom, you know, I, I, one I just. Uh, Yeah, I boy, I, I can think of so many lessons. I can think of so many things that I learned and, and I thought, man, I I'll never get there. You know, I will just never get to there. And he and he one thing he would always tell me is that he said, I'm making I'm making mistakes every day. And and I'm and and that's that's part of the deal as as coaches is, is we're 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 in the, the, the battlefield with these players, you know, we're in the trenches and, and we're learning too, and we're not always perfect. And we may say something, and go, Oh my gosh, did I just say it that way? Like, how stupid am I? Like, you know what I mean? And and uh and and so I think for Tom, for me, what sticks out is, is it probably started with the practice plan and, and he was a master practice planner. He, it was a, it was, it was, he's a, he's wired that way. He's wired to be incredibly meticulous with, with details. And I think it's, 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 it's kind of a beautiful mind type stuff, you know, like he's going to write out the practice and you go, Oh my gosh, okay. How's this going to lead to that? And he's got a full, his plan is perfectly clear once he gets done with it. And, and I think it starts with the practice plan and, and, and here in this activity, And, and he would assign us each assistant coach. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm almost certain he's still doing this now. I'm not in his gym, but um, that, that each coach had a very specific thing within this context, within this framework of what they were going to be focused on with the players. So in this activity, John, you're watching players four step approach or, Hey, you're watching their eye work. Are they getting on the setter fast enough? You're watching their blocking. Are they getting over early? Um, and I think so. The context was, was really laid out nice and clearly. So, you didn't go off course and start saying more than you needed to say and, and distorting the mental representation that the athlete has for that skill. Mm. So it was very clear. It was very specific. And I think that's got to be my biggest lesson from him was it started with the practice plan. It wasn't, Hey, here we are in practice. Go coach. No, <laughs> no, 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 that wasn't going to go very well. That was, gonna, that was not going to go well for him at all. You know? And uh, I think for me, How, how I use that in my, it is we have a, we have a quick meeting before every practice. Um, it, our, our days get crazy. As you, as you know, every day, our days are always a little bit different that we have a meeting and talk about practice. Here's what I want to get out of this activity. Here's what I need to see um, this player get better at today. And, and she's working on this and, and let's give her some space. Let, let's, let's meet her where she's at. Let, let's give her some space. But let's keep nudging her uh, And this player. Hey, she's got to make this change. You know, we've got to make this change today in practice. Um, and so I think it, it's, it's given me that perspective of saying, okay, Here's Tom. Here's me, and, and I'm, it's kind of you know right right there the sweet spot that works for me. How do you think? How do you think we we keep things fair for everyone when we need to treat everyone independently, be very specific with each player, everyone fairly, but not equal. So what is the fairness? Um, you know, and how do you establish that um, in your gym? Like what 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 have you learned about this? about treating everyone differently, but of keeping um, at the same time the same expectations for everyone? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, I actually just had a player mention that to us in our, kind of our end of the year. We used to do them in face-to-face, -face, but we do them Zooms now. You know, um, uh, one, one, of, you know, one of the things she mentioned was she feels like even though she wasn't a player that was starting or seeing a whole lot of time in matches, that uh, she felt like she felt like she was always respected. She felt like she was she was spoken to fairly. And as you mentioned, there's a balance with that. And 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 it's not that we just ignore you over there. And hey, you're not ever going to get there. And I think we two concepts stick out for me. One is this idea that initial ability. So where you're at today has no correlation to where you'll be tomorrow. And it's my job to help close that gap where you are and where you want to be. I'm here to help close that gap for you. I can't do it for you, but I can help you as much as I can. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is is you know we always. I think we, 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 we intermix the group all the time. So outside hitter one is not always with setter one and outside hitter two is not always with setter two, you know, that we're mixing the groups when we compete all the time. And, and I think that the, the, for me, the thought process behind it is if, if everybody can get better, my, from my lowest player, my, you know, my player, that's maybe a little lowest, lower point on my, on my depth chart to my best player that we're all going to get better together. And, and as we do that, It's my job then to, to make it really clear for them. Hey, here's what we're working towards, and here's why we're doing this. And and I, and and yes, there got there has to be a point where 
this side does need to play a little bit together because tomorrow night they're going to go compete for, you know, for whatever it is that's on the line. And, um, and, and, and they do need to practice together, but the, the majority of the time we intermix the groups. And I think we, we understand that initial ability and final ability are not highly correlated. So, and that's, that's more of a Carl thing. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and I, I love it. And I've held onto it for a long time because it's so true. You know, a player comes in with this skill set. It's my job to get her to where she wants to go. And if she doesn't get there, then, Hey, at least we did all we could. How about Jason Watson? What is what do you have from him? What what have mm. you taken from him and his gym? You're like, okay, I need to do this uh, for for my own program. What yeah. what makes him special? Because I remember Jason from uh, back in around 2003. He sat with me in Puerto Rico and explained me the blogging system that he used using salt, pepper, and an other thing that we had uh, in uh, <laughs> what. I That's know. awesome. It's so funny. Um, he, he, he does. You at that yes. Point. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Man, so many, so many awesome lessons. I think the the part that sticks out to me with Jason is is his patience. Is is how he he. I think he he's very methodical. He's slow to speak, but when he speaks, it's very measured. It's specific. Mm-hmm. It's it's absolutely clear. Even though he's got a little Australian accent, you know. Um, <laughs> but but it's 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 totally it, it's. He's articulate and patient. And I think when it comes to him as a coach, I think he has a really clear understanding of where he wants to go and how he's going to get there. And, and he's as patient as anyone. And he, he says it a lot. I'm going to be the most patient coach in the NCAA. And, and, and sometimes, you know, underneath his breath, you know, he say something that doesn't sound so patient and only I know that, you know, but, uh, but the reality is, 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 is he's, he's incredibly patient and his athletes can, can trust him that he's not going to lose his mind. He's not going to, He's not going to get frustrated that with them to the point where he, where he is going to, they're going to feel his anxiousness or they're going to feel his, his nervousness or his, his anger, not anger, but, but his disappointment in a play. And, and, and I think that's what makes his players feel like they can go let it rip all the time because, Hey, my coach has my back. And I think that's what makes him so absolutely unique. Um, in your own personality, you see with someone with a lot of energy, John, you know, you're yeah. so optimistic about things, you know, a lot of energy about things. Remind me a lot of, of my current head coach here at Eastern Illinois, Sarah Thomas. So tell me, do, do your players feed from that? And, and is this the way that you are 24-7? Or, you know, is this the way that you feel that you need to be as a coach? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, Karch says it a lot. You know, he says he's a volleyball nerd. He's a volley nerd, you know, <laughs> and uh, I'm a volley nerd too. And, you know, I, I just get excited about it. I, I, I love this profession. I love the idea that we get to go and be better than we were yesterday. And, and there's no judgment. I mean, of course there's always a little bit of judgment, right? But, but that's part of the, you know, that's part of it. But I, I get to go be better than I was yesterday and I go get to help my team be better than they were the day before. And, and I think you've got to have a little more, uh, you got to have a little more in you than them at times, right? Because maybe they're coming in and it's been a hard day or it's been, Hey, something just happened in a relationship, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, something just happened or Hey, a, a, a mom or a dad situation. And, I got to, Hey, I got to, I got to come somehow and get the best out of you. And I think I've got to do that every day. And I, and I mean, I am so nervous before every practice. I'm like, I'm, I no, really, I am like, like, I'm so nervous because I want it to be so perfect. And I know that it's not going to be, but I want it to be so good. And I want them to come in with that passion in, in that, Hey, we're here at practice. Anything that took place, it, it has no impact on me for the next two hours, the next two and a half hours. And so we meditate before practice. We, we, I shouldn't say meditate. We visualize or we get connected. We breathe together for about a minute. It's nothing weird. It's just, hey, close your eyes, find find your space and, and get connected. So use this one minute if you want to, to let go of all the crap that just happened in your day that you're carrying around with you. Just let it go because what's going to happen next is right here on the whiteboard and we're going to crush today because my job is we have four practices or whatever. My job is in these four practices to close the gap from where we are today to where we want to be at the end of these four days when we go and compete. And so I got to have a little energy. I got and, and so, yeah, I think this is who I am. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah. And then, you know, being, uh, you know, a recent head coach, um, can you tell me a little bit about your transition into that role now and have you changed from when you were an assistant coach? And, and then what are important things to keep in mind building a staff? Gosh, great questions. Um, yeah, I, I have I have changed. And, and, and I think the process of the process of, of, of taking over a program, no matter, Hey, it was the top of the program or the bottom, you know, bottom of the league, top of the league. I don't know if that's the, the case for me. I think it's more so about the type of people that I want around me. 
uh, and the type of people that I want to help create. And it's not that they're bad people. It's not that they have anything wrong with them. It's just what type of people do I want around me and how do I want to impact them? And so I think that the first, the first thing that I had to do was create some language around that. And, and so I, I put together some core values that worked for me. And again, I think you could probably have your team help you come up with this, but I was not interested at all, like zero. I wanted it to come from me. This is who I am. And either you're on board with this or we've got to talk, you know, and let's figure out why you wouldn't be on board. Because I don't think I'm that far off from, from trying to do what's best for you. Mm -hmm. and so, so we said, you know, for what I said was I wanted people that were humble. I wanted people that, that knew that they can learn from anybody, that they, that, they, that they put other people ahead of themselves, that it's not about them, and that they're humble individuals, that they're, that, that, number two, they're hungry. They want to be great in all that they do in life, in, in school, in volleyball. Uh, that they're grateful that not not just because I'm their coach not 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 I, I'm not like that but they're grateful for the opportunity to play volleyball they're grateful to represent this this really unique state we live in they're grateful to represent this city and they're grateful to have each other and and that attitude of gratitude is really important for me like it's not just saying thank you after I hold the door but it's like hey I'm genuinely thrilled that I get to be a part of this program and and I thought that 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 had to resonate and if it didn't then I don't know if we're going to work well together you know and and the last one was um, this idea of kindness. Like I walked into the gym on the first day and maybe people are nervous. Hey guys, what's going on? How are we doing? Two of them looked up and one waved and I'm like, oh my gosh, are these people like, like what's wrong with these people? Like, is it me? Like, do I have something in my teeth? What's the matter? And, uh, and, I, and, and, and I just realized, I just want to be around kind people. Like, like at the end of the day, we're going to win and lose. We're going to succeed and we're going to fail. All those great things. And if you're doing it with a bunch of knuckleheads, it's so hollow. It doesn't mean anything. And if you do it with a group of people that you just are, that you love and they love you and there's this, there's this comfort and this belonging, like, man, it means, it means everything to me. And so that's what I tried to build. And it wasn't about X's and O's. It really wasn't. Yeah. We want to play the game a little faster. We want our blockers in a more of a bunch. We want our defense this way. And we want them looking at these things, but that was all secondary to the type of people I wanted around me. And so to answer your second question, I think that was, that was it. Like I didn't care what my staff knew. I really didn't. I didn't care if they were players or not. I didn't care if they coached division one or not. I didn't care if they, God had masters or PhDs in, in motor learning. I, I didn't care. I, I wanted really good people because at the end of the day, I want my athletes to be good people. I want to be around good people. And I think we have to have examples of it. And, and so I, I, my, 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 my philosophy on that was it hasn't changed. I don't know. You know, I haven't had any turnover, like no one's left or anything like that, but, but I think they value this idea that, I'll, that I'm not saying I'm perfect, but we'll get, we'll get you caught up. If, if, if you're now taking over our defense and you've always been an offensive minded person, I'll get you caught up. We will do whatever we have to do. We'll call Tom every Friday for the next four Fridays to get you caught up. If that, yeah, I, I only, I'm joking about that, but, um, <laughs> but we'll, we'll do what we have to do, right? We can, we can catch you up on that stuff. But what I can't catch you up on is, 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 is arrogance. Or I can't catch you up on a lack of, a lack of hunger or drive. I can't catch you up on, you know, being kind of a punk, you know, I, I don't want to be around knuckleheads and punks, you know, and, and I can't catch you up on, on this idea that, if you're not grateful for the opportunity to coach with me or be around this program, like I can't catch you up on that. And so we're not going to be a good fit, but if you do have those things and we're going to be a great fit. And, if, and it turns out that that attracted some people to me and that attracted some people to this program and this opportunity that, that are awesome people and they're fantastic coaches and they're, and they're, they're bought in on this idea that none of us are, are good enough. You know, we're, we're, we're trying to do something that's never been done at UNM, which is to win the mountain West, which is a really good league. You know, there's a lot of good leagues out there. We're not, we're no different than anybody else, but it's a good league. And, um, and it's never been done here. And, and I'm pretty stubborn and I want to do it. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. I, I can't tell you, hey, on February, you know, no, I, I can't tell you that. But but it's going to happen. And, and I want people around me that understand, hey, that's going to be a process. And it's going to take some time. And, and we got to do our best to create great people. What is something that you are currently working on that you feel like you have opportunities to you know we all know that we have you know we we want to be master learners uh so we're learning everything but what is something that you're really curious about that you don't feel that it, it is your strongest point as a coach um that john newman is working on in this pandemic throughout this pandemic great great question we, we started I, at the beginning of the pandemic i, I asked my I, I asked my team and my staff hey what are some things we want to learn what do we want to get better at during this time because I think you can choose, you can do go two ways during this, you know, you can just stay who you are, you know, for the next, who knows, until we all get back together, or hey, we can try to get better every day and, and, and what we're doing. And for our staff, you know, I bought us each a copy of the book Peak, and I'm not saying it's the best book I've ever read, or read but uh, skill acquisition and, 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 and how do we, how do we de develop uh, players and, and how do we develop as coaches using deliberate practice techniques and, and, and methodology. And, and, and that has just been 
for me, it's been really eye opening to remind me of what it is we have to get better at. And it's a skill that I tend to rush through. Um, but I think I, I rush through giving a great mental representation. I rush through sometimes this process of making it so absolutely clear that there's no way I can, you can confuse it for something else when I say, here's how we want to perform this skill, or here's how this system is going to work for us, or here's what we're trying to accomplish with this drill. And I think sometimes for me, I'm pretty excited. I talk fast when I get excited. And next thing I know, I'm down the safari trail and someone's got to bring me back to the trail, right? Like, hey, you're off course here. Come on back. Come on, guy. So I, I think that's a big deal to me um, to get better at, 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 at adding clarity and, 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 and adding value to that clarity. Here's why we're doing this. Not just why what we're doing, but here's why. And I think I rush that stuff a lot. Um, yeah. And I think it can help my team um, just not only understand what we're doing, but also like I think it can accelerate their learning process. So uh, that's something I'm, I'm working on. What is your best skill as a coach? Mm -hmm. I, I, I got to think, you know, that, that, that I, I love, I love two things. One, I love people. Like, like, like I'm pretty fired up on that stuff. Like I really do enjoy that, like getting to know this team and, and it's not, I'm not perfect at it. Like, I, like I'm not this great, like, Hey, sit down, let's have coffee. And talk. like, I'm not great at that, but I'm, I'm working on that. But I think I generally care about them being their, them, their best selves, whatever that means for them. And I know that's a catchy phrase, but I really am. I, I want them to be their, the best student that they want to be. And so how can I help you with that? And, And hey, I want to I want to get better at interpersonal relationships. And okay, hey, let's talk about what does that mean and how do we do that? And I want to get better at, at being a libero. Okay, great. Let's go watch some film. And and I think that's something else that I'd say that's my number two is I I I love studying. I, I love I love looking at it. I am when I'm in the middle of practice, I'm, I say to myself sometimes, like man, I can't wait. I got to look at my my watch. I'm gonna I can't wait to watch film on that last play. Like I know we can get better at it. And I missed it. I missed what that what the missing ingredient was there. I'm gonna timestamp it in my head and say. As soon as I get back to my office, I'm going to go watch at one hour and two minutes into practice. What the heck happened there? Because I got to go get better with my team. So I love studying it. I don't know if that that makes sense, but um, I, I love kind of diving into the, the the weeds with it. Okay, and and within that study, like what are the things that you normally like to analyze in film? Let's say about your own team. And of course, it varies yeah. according to what you're working on, but in general, where do your eyes immediately go to? Yeah, I think, you know, I think right now I'm, 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 I was so, I was so stuck on getting our team better defensively. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I was so stuck on getting our team better defensively that I, I was, I was really drawn towards, okay, how disciplined are we playing this game? And, 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 and what did, what, what did it look like and, and how we were, we were making plays. And, and I think that to me was a, yeah, where my eyes typically drew, were drawn to was, was, was block defense um, and, and kind of what we were doing with that. So. Okay. There we go. Now, do you feel that side out is the number one thing in the game, or do you emphasize on something different in, in your in your um, video evaluation? Yeah, I, 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 I'm trending. I, I have a a mentor that that I, I feel incredibly disappointed in myself that I didn't mention that that I speak to weekly, if not sometimes daily in season. Uh, is Ron Larson? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, Call, to call him a friend would be doing him a disservice. He's 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 a he's a mentor of the greatest level, you know, for me. And he tells me when I'm being an idiot. He tells me when my team's playing like crap. He uh, he asked me what the hell I'm doing in practice that week that led to this. And he he gets on me and he makes me better. And uh, so and he's challenging me in this quarantine to get better with with studying side out and and studying what is it going to take for us to win uh, our league and and how are we going to have to do that? And so so what is it going to take for you to win the league? Yeah, I think one of the biggest areas that, that we um, that we kind of missed the mark on was was our ability to play the game in not so perfect situations. So can can we get better in medium and, and, and not so good pass or, or bad pass? And and can we get better at finding solutions for our hitters and still playing the game uh, with some tempo, with some with some speed to our antennas? Um, it was also a little bit we, we had to upgrade our middle blocker position, um, and, and I think we, we we did a nice job recruiting this off season. Uh, with, with bringing in some, some really talented players for that. Uh, and so, and, 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 and yeah, I think there's a lot, you know, gosh, I could keep going for a long time, but uh, there's a lot we got to get better at. Um, you know, when, when, when I watch your team, I think that you are already creating, you know, your own system there. Everyone seems to be working straight and simple, you know, so receive, I see you working on reading. So there's a process before start receive happens, you know, hands on knees, then down, straight and simple, angles of your of your midline. Um, you know, there's already a lot of good work that you have been doing with your team. How much do you think it matters 
to work on things be that you know that matter before the player gets the ball like that like reading skills like knowing when to grab your hands like knowing when to move laterally in the block like knowing when to go on the attack like how much do you work on those things but uh i think i think to say you know i think that the the idea is that while we're playing the game it's my job to put in some some constraints you know it's it's my job to put some structure to it and 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 ask the question a lot is is hey what did you see here or, or why did we make that move and to get them to to not micromanage their thought process because at the end of the day we want them to go compete their tails off you know i can, I can get really good at, at putting your wrists and hands together here or or hey our setters want to finish this way or something like that and, and I think for me, it's, it's, it's adding kind of that layer of what you're talking about. Like, hey, before this happens in this situation, what should we be looking at? Where should we put our eyes? Um, Jason Watson likes to say a lot that, that we're detectives, and, and I love that. We're, we're detectives. We're looking for clues all the time. We're seeing, we're knowing, and responding. And, and, and so whether it's in transition, whether it's in first ball, whether it's in block and defense, or whether it's in offense – it's, it's what are the clues? What do I need to know about this situation to give myself the best advantage? And, and then after that takes place is, is, did I put my team in the best situation? If I didn't score the point, did I put my team in the best, it, the best situation or did I gain the advantage in this rally? Is it more highly likely that if I tip to zone two right over the block as a zone four hitter, um, that I get a free ball or a chip or kind of a roll shot back? Or if I tip it to the donut, is there a higher percentage there that I get, hey, a hard driven ball back at me? You know, and so I think studying the game in that way and and Jason, Jason does that. And, and I think that's one thing that I learned from him. As I told you, I think he's incredibly gifted with, with how deliberate he is with what he does. And, hey, we said you, you can no longer tip deep to zone one because we studied it. And it turned out that when we tipped deep to zone one, if we didn't score, the chances were above 50 percent, almost 60 percent that we were going to get it driven at us. Uh -huh. But if we short to zone two, 40 percent of the time, we were going to get a chip or a tip back at us. Mm -hmm. Which, hey, I'll take the chip or tip much more over the hard driven ball any day of the week. So, uh, so I think looking at the game that way it kind of kind of helps get, guide some of the decisions there. Building a scouting report, um, more emphasis on the setter or attacker tendencies in the NCAA <laughs> Division One here in the United States. What do you think? Yeah. Okay, if I could only, if I could only do one thing, I could I could choose setter. You know, hey, let's look at hey when her arms do this or when her back does this or looking at the clues that a setter gives us as detectives or knowing what their offensive patterns are and the, and kind of the patterns of, Hey, on medium pass, they'll do this. And in this rotation, they're going to look to get this hitter. Boy, I would. <laughs> you know, I, I, I would, I would tend my, my, I would tend to say that I want to be really good at understanding their, their rotational tendencies. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I and, slow down there. Yeah, if I could slow down their, their ability to side out, if I could slow down their ability to side out uh, and give my chance a better opportunity to score points from the service line, I think I would take that. And I think that might be looking at their tendencies. John, what are we going to do with the gap goals in such a fast, uh, fast <laughs> and powerful game right now being played? Um, you know, what's your solution? Do you find do you find a formula in, in the University of New Mexico and you have it hidden in your gym? Um, you know, what is it that, uh, you want that no one else is? Tell me. There's uh, one. There's no secrets here at the New Mexico gym. If uh, if anyone wants to come visit, you you you're not going to see any secrets from us. But uh, I think it's I think it's getting our right side blockers uh, incredibly incredibly uh, visual and getting them really good at seeing the game and understanding in this situation. Hey, this gap is on. If the gap route is on and she's not on a tight quick to the setter. Hey, you, your your eyes have to be really good, and it's not micromanaging. And I want them to study the game, and I want them to see the game, and to know what clues you have to look for. And then I need you to be able to respond if it goes over the top of the gap. I need you to be able to respond to the go, and I need your hands over before the hitter's hitting, because because otherwise, yeah, why are we blocking? Um, and so I think I think for us, it's it's can we give them the number one? Can we give them the movement patterns that are most effective in a short amount of time? So is it a crossover two? where I'm just taking a jab crossover and then I'm, I'm drifting off that outside leg. Is it a, is it a shuffle two or shuffle three where I'm kind of shuffling, shuffling and getting go. Um, it's more than likely not a crossover three or three step crossover move. Mm -hmm. um, and then in some situations, you know, I, I, I know some coaches are diehard. Hey, we're read blockers and we don't move, mm -hmm. but 
I found that in our gym, we like uh, a system that Coach Jamie Morrison put into place with Team USA in 2014 or 13, I believe. An our stuff coach, yes. Yeah, uh, where basically we're on a zero, which is we just read. A one, we dedicate or take one step. Two, we front. And three, we commit. Um, so if I feel like, hey, this gap go is killing us, then I may put a two on it, which means, hey, middle blocker, two. And she knows I'm going to go front the gap hitter. And if it goes over the top of the gap, I can still be that I'm that much closer to the go attacker in zone four on the other side. Um, and when, you, when you're talking about fronting the gap, um, is it more like a dedicate step or is it like a full step front in front of the it gap? Is a, yeah. So a dedicate for me would just be I'm going to close the distance. Maybe I, I cut it in half. You know, I take one hard step, one hard shuffle step in that direction. Um, and then, like, and that would be a one, you know, a zero is read, stay in the middle of the court, just respond to what you see. Right. The two, the two is, is I want you in front of her. I want you to get in front of her. And it's, that's hard, you know, cause the game happens so fast, but, but that's hard. And so, uh, but, but I need you to close that space. I need you to put a little more pressure. She's got a lot of seam that she's attacking between the two blockers, the middle and the right side. Hey, let's get in front of that. And, and then on, on the, on the three is, Hey, you're going to get in front of it. And, and, and when she leaves the ground, I need you already off the ground. In comparison to your conference um, in the NCAA Division One, and then working with USA Volleyball international level, um, blocking the slide and you know and and basically preparing for slide attack, single block, double block, read block, or anything else specific. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, the t Team USA uh, put in place again. I think this was. Uh, Maybe, I don't know if it was happening in Hughes' quad or not, if they use this language, but I know in Karch's quads, uh, the last two quads, and, you know, obviously we're uh, uh, we're still in it, you know, because 21 is going to be the Olympics. But uh, as we as we look at that, the, the language that was used to defend slide was 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 a mirror move. Um, and that was where the left side blocker mirrored the slide attacker. So as soon as the middle blocker got behind the setter, it maybe starts with a dedicate. It's just a one step because maybe she's going to come on a tight slide right behind the setter's head. Mm -hmm. um, and then if it's a wide slide or, or, or all the way to the antenna, then we mirror it. And we want our right foot coming, our crossover step coming when she's putting her left foot down. So we want to mirror the move just like a mirror would reflect. Mm -hmm. um, I do think a double block is, 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 yeah, I think it's more than possible. I think it's really hard, especially depending on how fast the slide is. And maybe that's where uh, that's where our middle blockers need to have some different footwork patterns, some different tools in their tool belt mm -hmm. to say, okay, in this situation, I've got to go a long distance in a short amount of time. So I'm going to use a crossover two and I'm going to drift mm -hmm. into that space. And if we can do that, then I think we can put a, put a pretty good, well-formed double block in front of that attacker. Cross step two, closing, not closing. Where do you stand right now today on that element? Do we close or just go low and in whatever we get to? Yeah, I think, you know, I think probably the bigger question for me is, is, is the eye work and, and, and are we seeing where the set is taking the hitter? And then are we, are we getting our hands over where the ball is actually going to cross the net? And I think those are two different things. If I'm in front of you, but you're this really good wrist away hitter, I'm not where the ball is going to cross the net. So I need my hands lined up and my body lined up in a position where I can impact that hitter. And so I think sometimes we say, boy, you got to close, you got to close, but the middle blocker flies right by the outside hitter or the right side hitter, whatever. And boom, we, we, yeah, the fireworks go off and okay. Well, I closed coach. I closed. Well, hold on a second. Where was the ball? Where was the set taking her? And that might be on the wing, you know, the pin, the pin blocker. Hey, maybe I went too far. My, my middle is just stuck on this idea where we've got to go close to her. And that's not the case for me. Uh, I would like to, I would like, I would like a double block in front of, in front of all of our attackers. We know that the more hands, the more, the more, the more of this they see, as an attacker, the hitting efficiency goes down. So my job is just to put as many blockers in front of them. Not, I, I'm not a huge triple block guy right now with my program, but um, I could see us maybe drifting into that space if, if it came to it. But um, I, I want four hands in front of every every attacker. How much time are you spending on your training with out of system work? You know, anything on exclamation or minus passes? Um, yeah. How much time do you spend there? And in those elements, are you combining block with random? Um, great. Yeah, good question. So I, I'm a big fan of a three ball sequence. So it's a, I'm serving to you. And then we're going to have a, a ball where I snap it. I, I'm as the coach, which is a little, which is blocked, right? That's not how the game is played. It's a blocked element. 
I'm going to snap it at the opposing side setter. So now there's a, there's a serve, there's a snap at the setter, which then forces an out of system situation and yep. then another serve. So in that situation, and I do this a lot, I would say it's a third of the time. If it, you know, maybe we only do a two ball sequence, a serve snap. And I, I try to put our team into some really wonky, chaotic, uh, ugly situations. Cause that's again, that crunchy space is where we've got to get better as a team. You know, I think all of these guys can hit some balls off of a, you know, a coach toss to the center, but can we get really good on a bump set that, that's off the net or further inside than we anticipated? And that's, that's the crunchy stuff that we got to get better at. Last two questions. What has your one year old taught you about learning? <laughs> uh, to get up and smile. You're going to get knocked down. You're going to get knocked on your butt all the time and you get up and you smile and everyone around you just, whoa, okay. He's okay. He's alive. You know, it's okay. Uh, he's, he's, he's just starting to walk, you know, from this side of the couch with his hand on the couch to that side of the couch and, and he's letting go now and, and boom, you know, boom. And, and, uh, he gets up with a smile and, and Hey, that's learning, isn't it? It's, it's ugly. It's hard. It, it sucks. You know, he wants to walk and, and his body's not quite there yet, but um, that's learning. And that's our gym. You know, Hey, you're going to get knocked down. It's going to, it's not going to suck, but it's going to be hard. And, and I understand that, but we've got to get up with a smile every time we get knocked down. The last question is what has this pandemic taught you about maximizing more than you did before it happened? Gosh. Yeah. Uh, maximizing it. When I think of it, I think of, Hey, what can we do for other people? Uh, it's not about me. And yes, I want to learn because it's selfish. I want my team to be good. Right. That's kind of a self-serving deal, but it's really not because I want my team to be good. Um, but, but we can do so much more than we think we can, you know, and, and maybe you're experiencing a little of that with this, with volley junkies. It's like, Hey, it started off as just a little idea and now I'm worldwide and I've got thousands of people that can't wait for your content. And, and, Um, and I hope in some small way I was able to kind of add to that, but if not, you know, I'm sorry. Um, but, 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 but the idea, you know, the idea that, that we can do so much more for each other and, and, and I'm not trying to go, you know, mother Teresa here, but the idea is, is just the, Hey, we can do more for each other and our communities and volleyball is just, it's just a language. It's just a way that we, we can do those things. And so how cool is that? And, and, uh, so, um, I, we, we're, we're doing a little coaches clinic for our local coaches. We're, we're, we're meeting with our team. We did a worldwide trash cleanup the other day. We all got out and took, picked up trash, you know, from four different countries and 12 States around the U S we can do these things and we can, we can, in some small way, add a little bit of light during this dark time. And I think that's what you're doing so exceptionally well. And so thank you. Thank you so much as well. And John, can you talk about that great idea that you had that you just spoke about, about what you're doing with your community? Because I think it's a great mm -hmm. example for, us and in college volleyball um, to try to contribute to our communities the same way. Can you talk about it? Yeah. So, you know, we just, we have three goals and, and we're simple and I just, I have to have these things. My brain works in, in these situations, like this organized way. I'm not the most organized person, but that's just how my brain works. And so we had, you know, our number one thing is we want our, our athletes to win their academics. We want them to, to know that academics are a priority. And so uh, that's number one. Number two is to win our league, win our mountain, win the mountain West. We've got some ways we want to go and do that. And three, was to win our community. And, and so what can we do to impact our community while we're all at home? And, and maybe we've got to wear masks or gloves and Hey, maybe we don't pick up certain types of trash, you know, needles can stay on the ground type stuff. Um, but, but Hey, there's trash and there's, there's garbage and, and we can go make our communities better because we're going to go to a park and clean up the cans and clean up the cups. And, and so we all went out for one hour um, and we put on our logo t-shirt. So they know who we are. People are wondering, Hey, what the heck is, Is that guy doing in the bushes cleaning up trash? You know, stuff like that. So, um, so we went out, we did it, and 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 we just we just thought it was an important way for us to stay connected to our community. And for and for me, selfishly, I want my athletes to know, like, if I say that we're going to win the community, we're going to do it. I don't know how we're going to do it in a pandemic, other than maybe picking up some trash. I don't know, but but that's something that we're going to do. When I tell you we're going to win the Mountain West, I don't know when it's going to happen. I can't tell you, but that's what we're working towards every day. When I can tell you we're going to win academics, it means. If you've got an academic appointment and it's in the middle of practice, get the heck out of practice. Go. I, I don't want, I don't want to see you in here. Get, go to practice, go to your meeting. Volleyball is not your, volleyball is your future in some ways, but my job is to, 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 to help you set you up for success beyond volleyball. Right. And so if, if I'm saying, Hey, you're going to fail this class because you have to be at practice. Like, no way. Like get out of the gym. My job is to set you up for 40 years beyond, not just the four years that you're here. Right. Um, It has been so good to you today, John. You know, I definitely enjoyed this great conversation. I want to mention really quickly that tomorrow we're going to have John Wong, 
from Texas, Texas Tech, Eduardo Fiallos from Colorado, and Joe Trincy from Gomez Square, and formerly from USA Volleyball. Um, and we're going to be working on data analytics. Um, so for everyone that likes that subject and everyone that is involved in volleyball in general, you yeah. need to watch the program tomorrow. And then uh, I'm going to also be uh, invited to uh, John Corman's um, program also that is called uh, Coaching Conversations on Friday. Mr. Tom Black is coming to our program, uh, exactly the coach that we were talking about a moment ago. Um, and then I'll be also participating in a YouTube program by Leonardo Peroni. So I invite everyone. And then Saturday, we're going to have the NCAA champion, Kevin Hambly, uh, coming to our program. He's Stanford University head coach. And then on Sunday, we finish the week with Giuseppe Vinci, which is the creator of Bolly Metrics, which is the actual app that we use for video, showing video today uh, to all of you. I'll mention really quickly that on Monday, if people are just like, trying to find ways to motivate players, trying to find ways to get creative throughout the pandemic, you need to definitely tune in on June 1st, where we're going to have Trevor Regan, the creator of what it was, tra uh, Training Ugly, and now it's the Learning Lab. He is a master on creating this type of situation, helping people develop a growth mindset, and many other subjects as well. So um, that is part of the people that we have coming in. I do have to mention that I'm really excited that on June 6th, we're going to have Bernardino on, Mr. Bernardo Resende. So uh, please continue to tune in to our conversations. It's been a great educational experience today. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did, John. Um, yeah. You're watching your Lobos compete in the NCAA Division One this coming year. We do not know how yet, but I just <laughs> like you, I am truly really hoping for NCAA Division One volleyball to happen as long as we keep our players safe and healthy. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Manola. I, I'm just thrilled I got to spend a little time with you today on your show. So thank you. All right. Take care, everyone, and thanks so much for tuning in. All right.